Howdy there folks, I'm Quinn of Snazzy Labs and I really only get about three types of comments on my videos. Great video, I like those by the way, keep, keep doing those. You're an apple sheep, okay? And please do an office tour. And I always respond to those guys saying, well, I just did an office tour. But in reality, it's been over two years since my last one. Time really flies when you're dead inside. <laughs> just kidding. It is probably time though that I do a new tour because the majority of the equipment that I showed in that last tour, well, I don't use anymore, I've upgraded. And I also figured this is probably the last office tour I will do from this office, the original Snazzy Labs headquarters. It's my last couple months as a part-time YouTuber. I'm going full-time very soon. And so I'm also upgrading to a bigger, better office. More than likely. It's not set in stone yet, but I think so. Anyway, I'll shut up. Let's get to the tour. Oh, by the way, if you're interested in any of this stuff, I've linked everything in the video description below. So check it out. It probably makes the most sense to talk about my video gear. This is the Canon C200. And people have been asking me about this since the day I got it saying, Quinn, isn't that overkill? You don't really need a cinema camera like this, do you? And you're right, I don't. <laughs> I bought one because I've wanted one for a while and uh, it's just a cool, fun toy to own, but also because it will save me an extraordinary amount of time. Uh, I can actually record audio directly into the camera and there are high quality preamplifiers inside of here so I don't have to do any work in post. I used to have to use an external recorder and mix them together. It was a huge pain in the butt. Um, it also has a lot of features like its autofocus capabilities are incredible. As a one-man team, like I don't have any assistance helping me to pull and rack focus. It just does it automatically and this camera is so good I can just trust it, set it, forget it, and know that everything, including my face, will be perfectly in focus. And that is worth time and money because I have had to reshoot several videos in the past because something was slightly out of focus or the camera didn't pull focus correctly or I didn't manually set focus correctly. So that's a really, really nice feature. And there are just a couple of other quality of life features that make it very, very nice to use. All of the metering features that I used to have to use an external monitor for are here. Um, I have a very nice flexible monitor that I can rotate and adjust in any situation I want. It just, it's, it's awesome. And I bought one and I am so happy with it and I can't believe I didn't buy one earlier. So yeah, that's the Canon C200. All right, let's talk audio. So ever since I got my Canon 5D Mark IV, which I've been using since January, I stopped using this microphone, my bread and butter, and have used, like I'm using right now in this video, a Sennheiser AVX lavalier microphone. The advantage to these is they're wireless, they're very easy to put on, they pick up everything like near my face so I don't need to be directly over the microphone. They're easy to use, but they don't sound mm, as good as a real microphone. And so now that I have my Canon C200 with the really good audio amplifier, I can plug the microphone, this XLR connector, directly into the camera. And since it's so easy and sounds so good, I'm going to come back to this microphone in future videos. And this is a weird little case. This microphone is the Rode NT5. Now this is not a vocal microphone. It's actually used for drums and guitars primarily. And so you might be wondering, well, why did you buy it? And that's because underneath this windscreen, there is a capsule which is made by Michael Jolie Engineering. And this holds the actual diaphragm. So this little part on top of the microphone is really what does pretty much all of the important stuff in the microphone. And this is just basically, you know, a hunk of electronics. And these are sold separately. The guy who makes them um, has replicated them so that they sound similar to Neumann microphones, which are very, very expensive studio vocal microphones. And I think it sounds fantastic. For under $500, you can get this set up and I think it sounds better than microphones that cost, you know, $1,000, $1,500. It's a great buy. Oh, hey, look who decided to join in on the fun. Alexa, turn off vacuum. This is the Roborock S5 and it's pretty cool. When Roborock reached out to me asking if they could sponsor this episode of Snazzy Labs, I got really excited because as you guys know, I only accept sponsorship of products that I actually love and use and the Roborock is awesome. Now you may not know it, but Roborock is actually a division of Xiaomi, the huge Chinese conglomerate which makes tons of awesome products. And the Roborock is an upgrade to the original Xiaomi Mi Robot vacuum, but this time around it has huge upgrades all across the board. 
In terms of hardware, it's got one of the highest suction ratings of any robotic vacuum on the market, and holy smokes, <laughs> does it have high suction. It completely sucked up dog and cat food and does remarkably well in carpet. What I find the most cool, however, is the oscillating LiDAR, the laser scanner, at the top of the robot. It is really neat and serves a couple of functions. For one, it maps the entire environment out for you inside of an app, so you can see at all times where your robot is in your house. But more importantly, it lets the robot know where it is at all times. So it goes into one room, it cleans the room, and then it leaves. It's not randomly driving back and forth like some of the other robotic vacuums on the market. It does the job, it gets done, and it gets out of the way. But the laser scanner is not the only cool sensor. It has front and side collision sensors to make sure that it doesn't run into any of your furniture. It's very gentle around corners and around obstacles, but it still gets very close to make sure that it does the job. It can even auto-detect between floor and carpet, and it adjusts both the suction and the wheel height accordingly, which is very cool. It's got an array of cliff sensors to prevent the vacuum from falling down the stairs, and then it's also got a bunch of stuff that I'm betting you probably expect, like a removable dustbin, which is actually a pretty nice size, and it empties out very easily, HEPA filters, and of course, a brush roller. And the brush roller is super nice, very easily removable and super easy to clean. Believe it or not, it even includes a mopping attachment that you can use on hardwood and tile floors, and it actually works really pretty good. But if you ask me, the real magic behind the Roborock is its Wi-Fi connectivity and really powerful app, Mi Home. What's really nice about the AI functionality, though, is it actually chooses a logical path. Most robotic vacuums, even more expensive ones, will just aimlessly wander about. This one says, okay, I'm in this room, I'm gonna clean this room, I'm gonna get out and leave, so that it can clean your house as quickly as possible and be out of sight, out of mind. But the best part is that you can get one on Amazon Prime for $549 shipped, which in my opinion is an incredible value for this amount of suction and you know this many AI features. And I know this is an ad, but I'm telling you seriously, one-to-one, -one, I'm buying a second one of these with my own money for my house because I think it's that fantastic. So check it out today with the link below. You'll support Snazzy Labs and honestly just get a killer vacuum. And now we get to the latest addition in my office. This is a Prusa i3 Mark III 3D printer. That's quite a mouthful. <laughs> this is certainly not an inexpensive a consumer 3D printer at $750 US. Now that's for the kit version. You have to build it yourself, which is what I did. And it was really quite a blast. It wasn't very hard, but it did take about uh, eight to 10 hours. You can buy them fully assembled if you're feeling lazy for about a thousand bucks. And again, people are a little intimidated by the price tag, but this is because it has a lot of features that other cheaper printers do not have. But you can get a really nice inexpensive 3D printer from China for about $250 to $300. It's amazing how much they've come down in price. And 3D printers are really not a very complicated technology. Basically in this area, they call it a hot end. It's just a big metal block that gets very, very hot and it melts the filament, which is just plastic, it back into liquid plastic and then it extrudes it. It pushes it out of a tiny hole and then it builds really any object you want. So it basically just takes plastic, melts it, and then puts it back together in a different shape. One feature that I really like about this printer, which makes it worth the money to me, is it's got a removable heat bed. Um, most uh, 3D printers, when you're done with the print, you have to get a, a like a putty knife or a spudger and kind of scrape it off because it really sticks on there. Like it's, this is really stuck. But this flexible plate, all I can do is lift it up and then I just go like this. Are you ready? It's pretty cool. <laughs> it's the best thing ever. And uh, yeah, but the print quality is really quite spectacular. And I I'm a big fan of it. I, I really like it so far. I bought it because I just like 3D printing in general. I think it's really fun. And because a lot of you have been asking for me to do a revisit to uh, my 3D printed Game Boy handheld that I started and a couple of other 3D printing projects. So. These are my studio monitors. They are from a company called Event, but they're actually owned by Rode. And they are the 2020 BAS model, which is sadly discontinued. The good thing about that though, is that you can pick these up on eBay for very inexpensively, about $350 to $400 per pair. So for two of them, and they sound incredible. They are allegedly studio monitors, but they're honestly not very good for monitoring because they're not very flat, but they're very fun and engaging. So for music listening, I love them. And I think they sound great for the price tag. 
I've had them for a couple years and I don't plan on replacing them anytime soon. By and large, my peripherals have remained mostly the same since my last office tour. The mouse has changed. This is a Contour Design Uni mouse. I was previously using the MX Master and I liked it, but I started getting irritations in my wrist. And it wasn't carpal tunnel, said my doctor, but he did recommend that I, I switch to a different mouse. And this one was enticing to me because if you think about it, your arm doesn't really rest sideways like the way we use our mouse. That's kind of a strain. It's more like vertical. So this mouse allows you to tilt it up so extremely high that you basically can use the mouse vertically. It was weird. It took some time to get used to. But ever since I switched over, I'm like, yeah, this is, this is legit. The problem is, is it doesn't have a side scrolling wheel. So I have to use my contour shuttle. Luckily, I use this pretty much anyway, but this I rely on even more now. This is from the same company, and I use this when I'm video editing. So I can uh, scrub and jog, and then also all my major hotkeys that I use in Final Cut Pro 10 are all pre-coded. So very, rare, uh, very rarely do I have to move back over to the keyboard to perform a command. I can pretty much do everything with these two devices, and it makes editing so much faster and so much easier. My mouse pad is almost 10 years old. It's MacPad is the name of the product and the company. And they went out of business. Their uh, owners were like immature and swore at people, apparently. <laughs> they, did, they didn't have a great track record, but I'll give them the fact that, man, 10 years and their aluminum trackpad still hangs out super nice. So I really like that and continue to use it. And then my keyboard is a DOS Keyboard Ultimate 4. Ultimate in that there are no markings on the keys. It's all blacked out. Uh, the switches are Cherry MX Blues, which is pretty nice. They are very loud, but they sound pretty pretty great, and it's a pleasure to type on them. And then I have a 3D printed escape key. I do plan to upgrade this keyboard to a Model F keyboard, a Model F replica that's going in reproduction right now. I'm very excited for it. It's a very expensive keyboard, but anyone that has ever typed on a Model F know that it knows that it's basically the best keyboard there is. Bakaline Spring is the bomb for, for typing. For gaming, not so great. But anyway, uh, I've got my 12 South high rise here. I actually just bought this the other day because heavens knows I'm not going to vase and mount my iMac Pro. Am I right? <laughs> so uh, I needed to, to figure something out to bring it up to my eye level because I'm very tall and this is the height that I need my wrists at. But when the iMac is sitting on its base, it's too short. Like it, it doesn't, it hurts my neck to look at. So I've raised it up with this High Rise Pro and it was very expensive and I'm kind of mad at myself for buying it, but I will admit that it does look very pretty. And so the, the Mac actually sits on this shelf right here. So I get a good four inches and you can store stuff in here and cable manage. So it is kind of nice. You can choose a walnut finish on the front or you can do aluminum. I think both look good. Um, I like the walnut. It doesn't really match my birch desk, but I like it anyway. And then of course I have an Amazon Echo and that's something that I use very frequently. Um, I don't use Google Home. I have one at my house, but I find myself using uh, the Amazon Echo products more, probably just because I'm, I'm more familiar with them. I don't think they're better by any stretch because Google's AI is about as good as it gets. But for home automation, I think Alexa, oh, I said the name, still remains top dog. I've got my iMac Pro. That's pretty great. And that's pretty much it for this desk. Oh, I do have over here some of my memory cards. This is a CFast card, which I use in my Canon C200. They are insanely expensive, <laughs> like, like frustratingly expensive. This is a 256 gig card and it's 300 bucks. Absolute insanity. But they are very, very fast. They're almost as fast as a SATA SSD and far faster than um, an SD card and they're really small. So anyway, uh, that's my desk area. Let's move on. Welcome to my gear shelf, the section of the room filled with wasted money and regret. Not really, but kind of. Each section has a label on it, a category label, and underneath it is, well, the corresponding items. Usually they're miscategorized. I kind of just throw stuff wherever there's room, but of course I've cleaned it up for the office tour so that it looks like I've got, you know, crap together. Really, I don't. But anyway, I have inventory labels on a lot of the stuff for depreciation and, well, inventory purposes, so I know who owns what and, you know, the whole tax thing. I don't know. I have to do it. Uh, I've also got up here a Ronin M. 
electronic gimbals in the last couple of years have just gotten so good. And so this is basically worthless. I bought this back when I had a part-time employee working with me, but now that I'm a single man show again, I have no purpose for this because well, I can't film myself with one of these things, at least not easily. And so I don't know why I have it. I kept it because I'm like, well, I spent a lot of money on it and I'll lose a bunch of money if I sell it, but now it's worth even less and I don't need it. And it doesn't work with my new camera because it's too heavy. But I really want the new Ronin S because that looks awesome and it's way better. And I don't need it because I'm still one man, but I want one. So I'll probably buy it. Uh, I've also got the controller for that over here. So that's kind of neat. I've got a spare light. Uh, this really serves no useful purpose whatsoever. I've got a couple uh, Manfrotto tripod mounts because these are handy. I have them attached to basically everything. Removing these plates sucks. So being able to put one on everything you mount on a tripod is very handy and they're cheap. They're like, I don't know, less than 10 bucks. Um, these are awesome <laughs> as they don't really do what they're supposed to do. This is a magnetic parts tray. So basically you just stick screws or whatever you want inside. Oops, that didn't work. Cut. See? Cool. So you just, they're not working. <laughs> they're not working very well right now. But you stick whatever you want and then you flip it upside down. And look at that. It kind of works. So I use these all the time when I'm doing computer disassembly, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Another thing that is nice is they are so magnetic that if you use non-magnetized screws, Putting them on here actually re-magnetizes them. Oh my goodness, it's the best when you're doing computer stuff and smartphone stuff and other stuff. Um, I have Chick-fil-A honey mustard sauce in case of emergency because this is the best sauce on the planet. Don't at me. And let's get into the gear down here, shall we? Okay, so this is my out of focus cameras and glass section. And as you can see, there are cameras and glass inside. I have my Canon 5D Mark IV, which I bought in January and has served me well uh, for most of this year. But you know, I switched to the C200. I'm selling this for $2,200 if anyone wants it. Um, I actually don't have that much glass for a YouTuber. I've got a 100 millimeter uh, macro lens, which is the best thing since sliced bread. It's a Canon L lens, f2.8. I have the trusty Sigma 18 to 35, which literally every YouTuber on the planet has. Hey, there's an inventory label. And um, I also right now on the camera that I'm shooting this on has the Canon uh, 24 to 70 f2.8 USM2. All expensive lenses, but I feel like I pretty much am done now. I don't need any more. There's guys with like, I don't know, a bajillion lenses. I don't need that many. This is an old Canon eight, uh, 10 to 18 that I don't use anymore and don't need and don't want. And so I'm going to need to sell this, but it's kind of a weird niche lens that no one wants and they're expensive. So yeah, I got to sell that. Um, I've got a matte box back here, which I really only use when I do very seldom client work because it looks expensive and you can charge more money when people think your gear is better than it really is. <laughs> uh, I've got a little tripod mount for a smartphone. These are kind of handy. Uh, lens cap. This is Color Checker Passport. I bought this back in the day when um, I was on Sony and had to color correct everything. But I haven't touched this since I got a Canon because the, because the colors are really good all the time. Okay, so this is my tool. Hey, get the heck out of your batteries. This is my tool shelf. Uh, I've got the iFixit ProTech Toolkit on top. They've been a sponsor in the past, like disclosure, but uh, not on this video. Anyway, this thing is awesome. Best $60 ever. I use it literally all the time, so that's handy. Um, but I've also got under here the new iFixit, I think it's called Maki uh, Toolkit. It's also $60 but it's got like 118 or 121, something like that bits. And there are so many in here that if basically you can't find the bit you need, well, it doesn't exist because it's got everything. And this is also $60, which I think is just an incredible value for such high quality parts. Um, I've got a bag here filled with miscellaneous tools. So that's a thing. I've also got digital calipers for when I need to measure something. These aren't incredibly accurate, but they're good enough and they're fun, so I like them. Uh, I've got isopropyl rubbing alcohol because you need that every time you clean off a CPU. I use this all the time. Um, I run through one of these like every couple months. <laughs> but luckily they're cheap and they're really great. I have some tools uh, named pencil and pen because those are tools and they're very helpful when I'm planning videos and whatnot. I actually write out my shot list for videos by hand on pen and paper like an old man. I know no one does that, but I do because I find pen and paper notes faster and easier than digital notes. Would you look at that? Uh, okay, what do I got back here? Uh, some tape, other uh, screwdrivers, glue stick, you know, the good stuff. And that's good. No, no more of that. Okay, this is my battery section. It's filled with batteries. I don't know what else you want to know about it. 
Uh, nothing too exciting there. And then this is my microphone section, which is also filled with microphones. I have an extra Rode NT5 in case mine goes bad, because they have been known to do that. I've got my Sennheiser Lav mic in there. And then I've also got an old school Electro Voice mic for when I do conventions and trade shows like uh, CES. And then down here, uh, I've just got a bunch of crap in those drawers. They look really organized, like PC parts. I'm going to open this. Uh, don't judge me, because it's, uh, it's a horror show. Basically, I just have jammed everything in here. Here's a loose GPU floating around right next to a fan, but you know, what a, you do what you got to do. And that's my gear shelf. Oh, by the way, there is my Rhino slider right there on the floor. Um, I bought that, and every YouTuber owns a slider, and you always see them in office tours, and you probably think, wow, those YouTubers use those all the time. I never use that thing. <laughs> it's too hard to set up. It's a pain, and I feel like my tripod shots are close enough, but... Uh, you know, when I hire someone to do all the video work, I'm going to make them use that because it does look nice. It's just, it's a pain in the butt and I don't want to do it. All right, let's talk lights. My main ones that I've been shooting on for the last two years are these flapjack is what they call them lights. They're basically very, very thin um, LED panels. So they're very light. They run pretty cool. They're fantastic. I really like them. Basically what happens is they're called edge lit LEDs. So there is a big old string of LEDs that are very bright and they are all flashing inwards. So the lights on the outside flash to the inside. That's why you can see it's a little brighter on the outside, but there is a reflector on the inside and then there is this big refraction uh, material. And so basically what it does is it creates a nice soft even light. And you can actually see if I look directly into it, there's not many hot spots on my face. There are a little because I'm very close, but there's not raw bare LEDs like that are harsh. So you don't have to put up um, the blankets or diffraction material to kind of reduce the light because it's already soft. And so for noobs like me who don't have a lot of room and don't want to spend tons of time doing lighting stuff, you can get a pretty decent image uh, without too many harsh, like overexposed spots on your face without having to use anything else. You just prop these up and you're good to go. And so I've really, really loved these. They are very bright and um, yeah, they're just a fantastic little light. I have pretty much all of my lights on Avenger C stands. These are offensively expensive, but they are so handy and so much better in my opinion than everything else that it makes them worth it. They're about $150 per stand, but they're freaking heavy and they can hold heavy lights. And the thing that I really like about this articulating knuckle here is what I can do is slide the light right here and then basically take the light and extend it out several feet and then turn the brightness up. And now check it out. I've got a hanging shot and I can, you know, put it really far away and they're just amazing. I love these C stands. They're like the best purchase in the world. If you don't own one, get one and it'll change your life and you'll spend as many hundreds of dollars that you need to to equip out your studio because they are the bomb. This is my newest light and I've had it, I'm not joking, less than 24 hours. So as you may have been able to tell in this video, the exposure is kind of weird and it, I don't know how to use this light yet is basically what I'm saying. And I shouldn't have used this video as the practice for this light, but I did and I'm going to get better. Anyway, this is from a Chinese company called Falcon Eyes and it is a very cool light. For one thing, uh, it's flexible, so you can actually roll the whole panel up, which is very handy. And you can see it is just absolutely monstrous. It is huge. If I spin it around here, you can see that it has a honeycomb grid pattern which is really nice because that makes the light very directional. So if you want a little less light, you just basically put it off axis a little and it reduces a lot of the light that hits the talent's face. I would call myself talent, but that's what other people call me. Uh, <laughs> anyway, that's just the term. Anyway, so if we actually pull this honeycomb grid layer down and this diffusion filter, you can see there are just strips of LEDs, kind of like what you would find inside of an RGB computer. <laughs> Difference being that they're only white. So these are pure white. And then if I turn the color temperature down slightly, you'll see that some um, other ones can turn on um, that are warmer. And so basically you just put this diffusion filter back up and as a consequence, um, it's not quite as soft as the other lights over there. And so I'm gonna have to probably get another layer of diffusion to make sure that the light is more soft and even, but this thing gets insanely bright. So I mentioned that you can make the color temperature really cool. Right now it's at 5600K, or I can dial it down and make the temperature warmer, more yellow. 
um, and it's actually really yellow. Let me demonstrate that by turning the brightness up a little. It gets very, very bright. Let's do this as the demo example because I, I put it any brighter and you won't be able to see anything on camera. So there's very orange tungsten. Okay, and now I can turn it up to 56 and you can see it is very much like daylight. It's very blue. I can turn it up to 100% and it is like the sun on earth. I'm not kidding. It is so friggin' bright. It's got this big massive controller and then a huge monstrous power supply. So it's not very portable, so to say, even though it is a rollable LED, but it looks to be pretty good. It does appear that there's a slight green cast to it, which is usually indicative of slightly lower quality lights, um, lower LEDs, that is. But um, it may just be a setting on my camera. Sometimes frequency of your refresh rate has stuff to do with that. So I'm going to have to look around. But anyway, um, it's not inexpensive at $1,000. But I will leave the link to it below if you're interested. Honestly, for YouTube, for most people, I would just recommend the Flapjacks. We're almost near the end of our tour. Um, Ikea says that this is a standing desk. I would disagree. <laughs> anyway, so I've got my teleprompter over here. Yes, I use a teleprompter. Hopefully not many of you knew this. I try really hard to not make it look like I'm reading the teleprompter. I kind of look off camera and do some things with my hands to kind of distract you from the fact that indeed I am reading most of my videos. I'm not reading this one, obviously, because it's long and redundant and silly. Uh, but yeah, I, I do script most of my videos. And the purpose for that is, well, for one, it's way more concise. If you've ever watched videos on YouTube, like most of the guys are like, yeah, so this, and then point A, point B, and now we're back to point A, and also point A. So yeah, at the end of the day, point A, and you're like, oh my gosh, you said the same thing like 10 times in a row. And so I use a, a teleprompter to avoid that. I also use it because I spend a lot of time video editing and I hate video editing. And when I use a teleprompter, I can pretty much do everything in one take. So it makes it a lot easier in post. I don't have to chop and then this video, I already know, is gonna take forever to edit. <laughs> anyway, um, other than that, I've got my big pile of phones here. That probably wasn't the best thing for the phones now that I think about it. Can you name all these phones though? Cause boy, there are a lot of them. I actually can. And that surprises me. To this day, I could still name every single phone and probably the year and maybe even month in which they were released. They're mostly older. I don't really review phones anymore. And thank goodness for that because guess what? Oh man, um, everyone reviews phones. Anyway, I've talked far too long. I need to shut up. Well, I don't know what more there is to show you. Thanks for coming along on this Invasion of Privacy tour. In all seriousness, thank you to each and every one of you, whether you are a new subscriber, an old subscriber, or maybe you're just watching for the first time. Really, each and every view does count, and I have been working towards making YouTube my job, my career, for, well, 10 years, since I was a lad, 15 years old. And I'm finally here, we're finally here, and I am so excited. So get ready for more awesome content, more frequent content, and more snazzy content than ever before, starting in uh, about September. Thank you so much for watching. Please get subscribed if you're not already. If you like this video, give it a like. If you didn't, well, that other button seems to work okay too. Watch some of my other awesome videos over here, but most importantly, and as always, stay snazzy. See you later, folks.